Oh. All right. Uh, we're very excited to have Haipun as our speaker today. He received his PhD in Maryland and was a postdoc at Perimeter and then Caltech before joining the faculty at Tsinghua University. He has been making important contributions to a wide range of topics, including dark matter, baryogenesis, neutrinos, and inflation. Today, he will be telling us about gravitational waves from first order phase transition during inflation. Please take it away. OK. So thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk. It's really my honor to give a talk at, uh, yeah, in the Minnesota Theory Group. And so I'm going to talk about gravitational waves from first order phase transition to inflation. And this is the work done with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Quin Feng Lu. And Quin Feng is also going to join, join Minnesota as a postdoc uh, uh, in, in September, I guess. And uh, also with Lian Tao, Professor Lian Tao Wang from Chicago and uh, with C.E. Zhou. C.E. is right now postdoc at uh, uh, Swither, no, where? Uh, actually, I don't remember, sorry. <laughs> I don't remember how to say that country's name in English, sorry about that. And he's going to, 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 to take another postdoc in University of, of Kobe. And so this is, this is work done uh, with this, um, uh, so based on based on this this work and also a uh, paper will be published very soon, mm -hmm. and so now let's start. So here's the outline of my talk. So here I will talk about motivations, and then I will talk about uh, the gravitational waves uh, from an instantaneous source during inflation, and then after that I will talk about uh, 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 gravitational waves from a source with finite duration, okay, during inflation, and uh, after that I'm going to talk about the gravitational waves from first order phase transition during inflation. And then I will summarize. Okay, so here is a brief history of our universe. Uh, and uh, so we believe that there, there should be a inflationary uh, period uh, before the traditional, before the, uh, the thermal big bang of our universe, right? So for these reasons, I think for this uh, audience, I don't need to explain all these all, all this, um, this, uh, uh, motivations for inflation. But uh, this one is actually very important is that do, the, there's a bonus that inflation not only solve all these questions, it can also generate the seed of large scale structure. And uh, so, and those large scale structures actually imprint on this. Uh, so, 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 so the information of this inflation actually uh, imprinted in this uh, large scale structures of our universe. And then, so we can measure we can measure them through this uh, CMB uh, microwave background, uh, microwave background, and also through this uh, large scale structure surveys. Uh, and this is the picture showing how this, uh, uh, how inflation solves the causal, uh, the causality problem uh, of the big bang, big bang expansion of our un of the universe. But to solve this problem. Actually, 40 to 60 efforts is required, right? So it requires that the universe expands 40 to 60 efforts during inflation. However, however, if we put everything together, put the CMB and the, all the uh, large scale surveys together, they can, we can only observe about 10 efforts of it. Okay, so we can only about the 10 efforts uh, within this 40 to 60 efforts that is required. Uh, for by inflation. So there's a very long theory to inflation, which is unknown to us. And that is the dark history part of the inflation, right? And so this is, a, so, so usually people doing cosmology, what they, what they do is, um, especially a few years ago, right? So what they do is the following. Usually they assume there's a potential like this. They assume there's a potential. And then they use the potential to, saw, to calculate NS and R where NIS is the, uh, is the index of the power spectrum and the R is the tensor to scalar ratio, okay? So they calculate all these things and then it's done, right? So because these are the things which can be measured and today we can also measure the Nagoshi entity, right? But also, but the Nagoshi entity is also measured in the, in the CMB, okay? So that is also belong to the first like ten, seven to 10 efforts, right? To inflation. Um, however, right, so this is the inflation potential people usually assume, but the measurement can only be lie here, right, by CMB and large scale structure. And the larger part of the potential is actually unknown, okay? And it can be smooth like this and controlled by one potential, one analytical form of potential. However, it can, it can also be like this, 
there can be a lot of wiggles, right? And we don't know, right? The people playing games with uh, uh, primordial black holes actually like this kind of potential environment, right? So basically we have no idea about, uh, almost no idea about the potential of this inflaton field uh, beyond this, uh, beyond the part which can be measured, right? And so, uh, but, but we all, what we also know is that inflation must have an end, right? So it is generic to expect that the inflation, the inflaton field to couple to some other spectator sector so that at the end of the inflation, the inflaton field will decay into other sectors so that that inflation can have an end, right? And uh, we also know is that, so the, infl the inflaton field usually evolves for a very large range during inflation. For example, usually in the model, the, the range of the inflaton field evolves is actually at a scale of Planck scale, right, of M Planck. And so therefore, if the inflaton field coupled to some other spectator field, and if the change of the inflaton field is so large, then the evolution of the inflaton field during, during inflation will actually change the, the, the environment of the spectator sector coupled to it a lot, right? So, and so it will change. So for example, it can change the mass or it can change the couplings, right? And so, so because it will change it, change the Lagrangian a lot, then maybe it will induce some kind of uh, phase transitions, right? For example, if the coupling from uh, if the coupling changes from the weak interaction into strong interaction, right? For example, uh, and then we usually expect a phase transition. For example, these are the two examples. So we, I just present two examples. In the first one, we just write down a potential, right? And here, phi is the inflaton field. And the sigma is some spectator field, right? And so during the expansion, during the evolution of phi, what you can see that it will, it probably it will flip the mass square of this sigma field, and so that so that in this case you can see that the first order phase transition uh, may have a chance to happen, right? And in the second example, we just uh, write down a young mirror theory, but we couple to the the inflaton field to this young mirror theory, and you can see that if the phi if phi changes. And it equivalently, it will change the coupling of this Yamir theory, right? And so it may change from the weak interaction regime into the strong interaction regime, right? Then there will be a fifth transition happen. And if there's a first, if the fifth transition is first order, then maybe uh, a classical gravitational waves might be produced during the fifth transition, right? And then if we can observe that gravitational waves, we may get some information, uh, we may get some information at this part which is uh, uh, so in the dark part of this uh, inf the, inflaton, the inflation arrow. Okay, so here's the motivations. And so now that starts to, call, to talk about the gravitational waves from an instantaneous source during inflation. Okay, so to do that, let's first have some, uh, uh, to introduce some frameworks. So usually when we do this, uh, when we talk about the expansion of the universe, we usually choose the metric like this. Right? And here A is the uh, scale factor and the gravitational waves is actually hiding here in the HIJ part, right? In the, in the perturbative part of the spatial, it, perturb, perturb, it is the perturbation of the spatial part of this, uh, of the metric. And so, and also this HIJ is required to be, uh, to be transverse and traceless, okay? And uh, yeah, it is the transverse and traceless part of H of this uh, metric, which is which gives us the information of the gravitational wave. And so usually uh, for convenience, we usually use the conformal time to do it. So we change uh, T into tau, right? And then the metric can be written in this way. And so what the inflation gives us is that, so the, what, what is special for inflation is that during inflation, a double dot is always larger than zero, okay? And then if we use the conformal time, and then the conformal times always have a finite upper bound, okay? And it is this upper bound, so, so because it has an upper bound, and this will give, give us the feature of the gravitational waves uh, we will show later, uh, we will see later in this talk. And uh, the size of tall is actually the, can be seen as the, the size of the commuting horizon. Okay, so to solve the gravitational waves, just like to solve the electromagnetic waves, right, in the in electro, then in electrodynamics. So what we can do is that first we want to solve the Green's function, and then we combine the Green's function 
together with the source, we can just uh, get the gravitational waves from any kind of source, right? And so, so then the first step is just to calculate the Green's function, and we assume that this uh, the source is uh, the source is like this, and then in forward space, the source can be written this way, and it is an instantaneous source, and then uh, and then the source is uh, actually independent of k, right? And so then this uh, the linearized Einstein equation in the forward space can be written this way, okay? Uh, okay, so now that starts to that starts to uh, examine what is the behavior of the of this green fun of this gravitational wave just from this uh, uh, instantaneous source. Okay, so there are actually two regions, right? So because it, uh, because the universe is fast expanding, okay, because the universe is fast expanding, so what it, we expect is that the 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 solution of H is actually a damped oscillation, okay? It has damped oscillation, but because we are considering we are considering an inflation case, the inflation case and this tall so always have an upper bound, and we can always choose the upper bound to be zero, right? And so, so, so the solution is that it will first oscillate, okay? It will first oscillate, and then it will stop at this boundary, okay? And so it will stop at this boundary, and then so, uh, and then this value is actually this value is H F at this boundary. And it will be frozen, right? So this is what people usually usually uh, usually say that uh, uh, when the wave evolves evolves out of the horizon, it's uh, it's, it will stop oscillating, and it, uh, uh, its strength will fix. Uh, it will be fixed, okay, out of the horizon. And so if and so so now if we choose another, so this is so t, top prime is the position of the as the the top prime is the conformal time where the source. You can see that where the source happens, right? And then because it is in the inflationary phase, so there's always an upper bound. There's always an upper bound for tau. And then so the k tau, the, this, uh, this k tau value. So from this source and the horizon is always a fixed value, okay? And so, and so if we change another value of k, you can see that it is also oscillating. But uh, at this boundary, at this boundary, there, it will fix to a different value, okay? It will fix to a different value. So then we can just uh, have, a, have a short summarize. So because the conformal time between the source and the horizon is fixed, so the phase of H, the phase of H, because we are calculating a Green's function, right? So the phase of H at the origin, at the source is also fixed. So, and then as a result, the phase of H at the boundary, at this horizon, it actually oscillates with k, okay? And so, and this hf, okay, hf is the value of this uh, uh, gravitational wave at the surface, at this surface, right? At the surface, at the, uh, at the horizon, you can see, at this horizon, it actually oscillates with k. And this hf, it is very important for our uh, next calculation because it, it will serve as the initial condition when this uh, uh, when this mode uh, evolves back into the horizon. So, any questions? So, I think for the later involve, involvement involvement, I have a naive question. That is k uh, uh, will remain at its initial value, or you are going to mix up? Um, the k. What do you mean by the k? Uh, so well, now we are because. Uh, we're considering a certain mode, right? So K is like a, a momentum. So it is uh, like a conserved value. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. The, the, I understand the, uh, you know, at K tau equals zero, the, they have different K mode will have different phase, right? That's, the, that's your somewhat uh, a condition for later in involvement. But uh, what, why it's special? Maybe I should wait until later part of the time. Yeah, okay. So, the, so now you can see that this- They are independent. They will just evolve as they are on mode. If, if, if K is- Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so now, yes. Okay, so maybe the next uh, uh, next few slides will, will, will answer our question, okay? So now what you can see is the following. Okay, so now let's, let's first have an example, right? So now let's, let's take the cosy the theta inflation as example. In the case of cosy the theta inflation, the expression for the scale factor is actually very easy. It is a minus one over h tau, and tau is from minus infinity to zero. And now we can just calculate h 
explicitly. Okay, it can be written in this way, and you can see that it is a it is a oscillation. It is actually so it is from the top prime. Top prime is the source, and then uh, and then it is oscillate with uh, with tall, and uh, so and also so it is a it is a damped oscillation, and the damping factor is actually here, right? Because this tall is actually from minus infinity to zero. Okay, so now you can see. So this is actually the boundary of this the theta space. Okay, this is the IR boundary of the, the theta space. Mm -hmm. And you can see that here for the value of uh, tau equal to zero, you can see there's a it, it is actually for different cho for different choices of k, it actually different. It is actually different, right? And so if we zoom in, it is like this. So if we, so for different values of k, it is different. And now let's change. This change the time from let's change from conformal time into the physical time. Okay, so now it looks like this. So then you can see that uh, from just from here we can we can tell that it is out of horizon. So then this uh, gravitational wave stops stop oscillation, right? And then it becomes a constant. So once it is out of horizon, it becomes constant. And this constant value is actually varies with uh, with with uh, uh, with the momentum of this mode right so that is actually very important because after inflation this values actually determines the initial condition of the of the uh, of the oscillation when this gravitational wave re-enters the horizon you can see it's like this so um, so once the inflation ends so once the inflation ends uh, so we, so after after the end of inflation so uh, after after the end of inflation, so once this mode is still out of horizon, so it will not change, and then it starts to oscillate once this mode re-enters the horizon. Okay, so for example, if in the in the radiation dominant uh, universe, this uh, the evolution can be written this way: it is always proportional to sine k tau divided by k tau, right? And in this case, uh, you can see that with different initial conditions. The amplitude of this oscillation is actually different, right? So if we so this picture shows that so shows that we connect this uh, inflationary uh, the inflationary case the inflationary period to the uh, radiation dominated period, right? So the so the in so here is the end of here is the end of inflation, and so before inflation it is oscillating, and then this mode evolves out of horizon, so then it's a uh, it stops oscillate and it becomes flat, and then this flat value H F will determine uh, will become the amplitude of this uh, uh, of the gravitational wave in the later evolution, right? And so now what you expect is that the spectrum of the gravitational waves, uh, so the spectrum of the gravitational waves from the uh, instantaneous source during inflation will oscillate with uh, this uh, with its wave number. So any questions? So basically there is a spec, so the spectrum has an oscillation, right? So you can see that it is the amplitude which oscillates with K, okay. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, so the reason you, you see the oscillation uh, in terms of the K uh, variable is because you're starting with the same uh, phase. Is that because yes. uh, you, you just assume that there's just no H in the beginning and you produce them at the same time? Yes, exactly. I see. Yes. Okay. So, so I also have another question. Yes. I just trying to want to understand. Uh, during inflation, you said that these wave, gravity waves are coming from these instantaneous sources. What's the origin of the sources? What? What? what yeah, what it will be. So yeah. So uh, it will be. Uh, so so in the later talk, so it will be from this uh, first order phase transition. So during inflation, you have to have some instantaneous source, right? You're saying that. Yes, that exactly. But where's that coming from? What's causing the source there? Again? Yeah, it'll be from. So we will assume it is from the first order phase transition. I see. So as the title of this talk, right? So you're saying that uh, during inflation, it's coming from the spectator sector. That's basically what you mean. Yes, exactly. I see. But this is on top of the normal uh, gravitational waves that are produced during inflation? Yes, yes. And I will show that there's a chance that this one is larger than the normal gravitational waves. The normal gravitational waves will be flat. Okay. So, yeah. so you're imagining then that there's a separate sector which is going to dominate then and produce these gravity waves. That, that's what you're going to assume. 
it will not be dom so its energy density will not dominate over this uh, uh, the inflationary sector. It will be smaller, but the gravitational wave will be much larger. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So now, uh, after after discussing this uh, uh, gravitational waves from the instantaneous source, now that's uh, give it, give the source a little bit uh, finite duration. Let's see what will happen. Right. Okay. So so the the gravitational wave from the instantaneous source can be seen as the Green's function, right? So and so then so the for the finite source, what we can do is just uh, we can we can just uh, convolute this Green's function together with the with the source, right? And so in forward space, we can always do it like this. Okay. So the Green's function, as we can see that there is a there's always an oscillating piece which can be written in this way. That we can we can so we actually can just calculate it explicitly, right? And so 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 then for for this um, uh, for general for general source for general source which can be parameterized by this uh, the Fourier transformation of this energy momentum tensor can be written. Uh, can be can be written like this, and so we just convolute this uh, uh, Green's function together with this source, and then we get we get this new uh, uh, tilde h h f. So f means means uh, means final, right? Means that at the means here. So 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 what we want to calculate during inflation is h f, because h f works as the initial condition for the later evolution of the gravitational wave, right? So this h f can be written in general can be written this way. It will depend on this uh, um, on the source and also there will be a, a model dependent factor and this factor will depend on the on how this uh, on the evolution of this uh, uh, the evolution of the universe during inflation as we will see we will see later. So we can prove that it can in general can be written this way. And so after so this is uh, so yeah this is HF. And after inflation, so because we already have HF, and we need to multiply HF with another evolution factor, which we call E. Okay, so E for the E for evolution, and so the so today uh, the gravitational wave can be written just in just like this. Okay, so there's a this is the uh, HF gives the initial condition, and this E gives the later evolution, and the later evolution can isn't always it, isn't it yeah. just called transfer function? Ah yes, we can call it transfer. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So from now on, we will call E as a transfer function. Yes. Okay. So this E can always can uh, can always be written as a damped oscillation, right? So this is the oscillating part, and this is the damping part, and A is again the scale factor. And uh, but there is another factor, this one, this E tilde, and this E tilde is actually related to the evolution of the universe when this mode re-enters the horizon, okay? And uh, so after we have this uh, H tilde, we can just use it to calculate the energy density of the gravitational waves following just the standard formula, okay? So you can see that it is H prime squared and prime here is the derivative with, with respect to tau, okay? So we can just calculate the energy density of the gravitational waves. Okay, so here we have a finite source, right? So what is uh, the, the difference between a finite source and the and the instantaneous source is because of course it's finite, right? And so because it's finite, and uh, we already seen that we already show that if it is an instantaneous source, then it is then the HF will actually oscillate, right? And so if it is a finite source, then we can always expand it, expand it, right? With with respect to a certain point at tau star. Around we can expand it around the tall star, right? And with a finite size. And so let me just show, show, show you some result. So basically we can just separate, separate it in the different regions. So if this, uh, so basically if the physical momentum of this, uh, if the physical momentum of the gravitational waves produced by this source, if it is, uh, if the physical momentum is much, much smaller than the size, physical size of the source, so that means a very long wavelength, right? And so in this case, we can just neglect. So the result is that we can just neglect the, let me just change to this one. We can just neglect the size of the source, right? And then again, we will have an oscillation, oscillating pattern in this spectrum. 
Okay, and so in this region, what we can show is that the energy density can be always written in this way. And so this is the this T theta is the first transformation of the source, and there's a cosine square which is the, shows you there's an oscillation right in this case, just like in the case of the Green's function, and then it will also be related to to the evolution of the universe when this mode uh, grow when this mode evolves out of the horizon, and it will also related to the uh, evolution of the universe. So basically the transfer function will, uh, so no, th this is not the transfer function, sorry. So this, will, this, 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 this is this factor, right? This factor is actually related to the evolution of the universe when this mode evolves back into the horizon, right? And so this is uh, the general formula. And for, for T theta, so there's, a, because now we are talking about a mode which is much, much larger. So its wavelength is much larger than the size of the source, right? And so people actually show, so in this next paper, they actually show that um, if, if, there's no, uh, if there's no like special infrared processes, right? If everything is euro, and then what they can show is that if KP is much, much smaller in the, much, much smaller than this, uh, than the size of the than the size of the source, then this forward transform in this 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 is just a constant. It becomes independent of k, right? Just like in the case of a in the case of the Green's function. In that case, what we have is a third function source, right? In a third function, the forward transformation of the third function is always a constant, right? This is just uh, shows that shows a more general case. Okay. So any questions? Okay, so, and we can see that, so basically in this feature, uh, so in, in, the, in this region, right? In this region, so in the region that is uh, this K, so, so in this region that is K times Delta, Delta is the source. So here we just uh, change into the, into using this uh, uh, conformal coordinate. And this one, the one with the P is the physical coordinate, right? And so in this case, you can, you can see that if this, uh, if this k delta is much much smaller than one, means that this wave number is much smaller. The the the, the means means that the wavelength is much larger than the size of the source, right? So in this case, there's always a oscillation pattern, right? But the wave the, the wavelength cannot be so large. If the wave is if the wavelength is much larger than the than the size of the horizon at the beginning, right? Then there's no oscillation piece. Okay, so. Yes, and so we can we can show it's, and uh, so 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 this is so here is so here everything is actually very similar in the in the case of the delta function source, right? But uh, what is the effect of the finite of the of the finite size? So what is the finite duration effect? So what we can imagine is like this, right? So what we have shown is just the following. So if you have an instantaneous source. If you have an instantaneous source, what you can show is that uh, the spectrum will actually oscillate with the uh, with the, uh, with the momentum, right? So you, so you can see that with different choice of k, you have with different choice of k, the value of h f is actually oscillating, right? But if there's a finite side of the source, then if the the if if this mode is from a different a different position a different uh, a different top prime, okay. A different, uh, different, uh, different time. If it if it is generated from a different time, you can see that there is a small change in this top prime, and then it will just induce a small change of HF, right? And so the oscillating pattern will actually be smeared a little bit, right? So the finite size will actually generate a smearing of this oscillating part, right? So this cosine square can be decomposed into a constant piece and a, a oscillating piece. And this oscillating piece will be smeared by this uh, uh, will be smeared a little bit by this finite side by, by this finite uh, finite duration effect. And so this is for the case that the uh, that the wavelength is still much larger than the size of the source. However, if the wavelength is smaller than the if the wavelength is smaller than the size of the source, what will happen? As you can already guess, that the whole oscillation pattern will just be smeared away, right? Will just be smeared away like this. So then in this case, there'll be no oscillation patterns. 
Okay, and what will happen if this uh, for very long wavelength case? So once this uh, wavelength is once it is produced, it is already longer than the longer than the than the size of the horizon, right? What will that happen? So then the picture is like this, right? So it is starts from somewhere, but because its wavelength is so long, right? So there's no chance for it to oscillate because it is outside the horizon once it is produced, right? So in that case, there will be no oscillation. Okay, so, so now in summary, what you can see is like this. So we have a source. So this is a, this is a picture of the evolution of the universe. And this dashed, this, uh, dashed line is the evolution, this, this, this brown line, brown, brown dashed line, is the evolution of the horizon, okay? This is the evolution of the horizon. And so once this mode is produced outside the horizon, right? So then there will be no oscillation. It's just like this. But if it is uh, produced inside the horizon, but the size is much, much larger than the, than the size of the, than the duration of the source, then we can still see some oscillation patterns, okay? We can see some oscillation patterns, for example, like this, okay? So you can see it's also, it changes if we change, if we change this, uh, uh, the wavelength, okay? However, if, it is a, if the wavelength is super short, like this, right? Then what we can see is that there's a still can be oscillation, but it is smeared by the finite duration of the source. So this is the uh, so this is a typical result of the spectrum of the gravitational waves. Okay, so you can see that there are three regions. Okay, so this is the IR part, and there's the oscillation uh, oscillatory part, and then this is the UV part, and uh, and so the result is that. The IR part will only depend on this, uh, uh, this uh, E theta. And the E theta is the evolution, is determined by the evolution of the universe when this mode evolves back into the horizon after inflation. And this oscillatory part will depend on this, uh, on, on this E, E theta, and also G theta. So remember, G theta is actually determined by the evolution of the universe when this mode evolved outside the horizon, okay? And this UV part will depend not only uh, on the product of E theta and G theta, it will also depend on the details of this model of inflation, right? And we know that, so, so, this, so there are actually a lot of peaks in the, oscillatory, in the oscillatory part, right? Actually, the largest peak is actually in this region. It's actually when this, uh, um, when this physical momentum when this physical momentum of the wave equals to the roughly around this uh, Hubble, the Hubble during inflation. Um, so why is that, right? So usually when we when we see a, gra a gravitational wave spectrum, it's the largest the largest part of the spectrum. The peak is actually at at here, right? So at the at here when the physical momentum is actually around the source, the size of the source. For example, in the case of the first order phase transition, so usually the peak is around the size of the bubble, right? The size of the bubble. But so what happened here? It is because that the gravitational wave will be distorted by the by the by the by inflation, right? So during if the gravitational wave is inside the horizon, right, it will be diluted, but uh, it will be diluted very fast. But the energy density will be diluted by a to the minus. Uh, Minus four fourth power, right? Um, yeah, by eight by eight to the minus four. But you can see that so in the in the spectrum there is a, actually k to the cubic here, right? So basically, basically although so uh, so basically although for larger spectrum for the for the for the for the for the, for the, for the gravitational wave with the physical momentum much much larger than the physical with the physical momentum much smaller. Than the, than the typical size, right? Although there is a suppression by k to the cubic, but because there is a fourth power due to the expansion of the universe, that means the larger, uh, that means the, the larger wavelengths actually gets, uh, so the gravitational wave with larger wavelengths actually gets smaller suppression, okay? That's why, uh, that's why this, uh, the peak is actually around kp roughly equal to the, uh, to the size of the Hubble, right, during inflation. Okay, so now let me give some examples. For example, we can consider so different inflation models actually give different uh, uh, give different uh, dependence of uh, GF 
on this uh, on the on the momentum. Okay, for example, in causing the theta inflation, right? So GF is just a proportional inversely to K, and in T to the P inflation, it's actually uh, very complicated. But the dependence is here, right? So we only so if we want to calculate the slope, we only care about this part, right? And this dependence is actually simple, right? And uh, so so basically. So why we here we consider T to the P inflation, right? Because we are actually consider the inflation period as a in the general case, right? So we only know that in the in the first few in the first few efforts, it is causing the theater. So, but in the in the period that we cannot measure, we don't have direct measurement. It actually can be anything, right? So, so as long as it is accelerated. So the expansion is accelerating. It's accelerating. So then it will give up. It can solve us these uh, uh, problems, right? So yeah. So here we we also consider the general case, and also for the evolution after inflation, right? So for example, if we in the radiation dominated error, and in, so so this uh, e theta is actually proportional to k inverse, and in the matter dominated error, this. Uh, uh, e theta is actually proportional to k to the minus two, right? And we can also actually start a, a general case. So yeah, even for after inflation, the evolution of the universe can actually be, so the scale factor can actually be written this way, t to the p theta, and for p theta smaller than one, right? And uh, so in the general case, we can actually calculate this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, e theta. Right, can be written this way. So in general, in the general case, so we list it, we list it here. So this uh, this actually this certain mode can actually evolve back into the horizon during so when so uh, so the universe the expansion of the universe can be actually in different cases. For example, we also consider the cosmic string dominant and domain wall dominant, and also there's something called a uh, connection. Right, I think there's a, yeah domination. So in some specific models, and each model can give us a different value of p theta, and actually corresponding to a different value of e, and then it will give us different spectrums. Oh, sorry. And so this is the, this is actually the uh, for di the spectrum for different scenarios. For example, in the in this picture, what we show is the case for different choices of p, right? In the t to the p model, and you can see that for different values of p. We can we can have different uh, uh, scenario. We can have different uh, slopes in the UV spectrum, and also different slopes in this oscillatory spectrum, in this oscillatory part of the spectrum. And also, we here we consider we also can consider that so, so after right after inflation, there is a temporary matter dominant error between the inflation phase, inflationary phase, and the radiation dominant universe, right? And so. If in that case, because we know we know that in during the in matter dominance, actually we have a different value for e theta, right? So basically, this part of the slope is a proportional to k to the first power, okay? And uh, and if it is if it comes if the mode comes back during radiation dominant error, then it is k to the cubic. And so basically, by observe if we can just observe these spectrums, we can actually tell the uh. We can actually tell this, uh, uh, the information of the evolution of the universe. Okay, so now let's talk about the first order phase transition. So why we want to consider first order phase transition? Because, uh, because we just uh, found there's a, there can be an oscillatory pattern, right? If the source, uh, if the duration of the source is much, much smaller than the, than the, uh, than the, than the horizon, right? Than the horizon, then we just have a, yeah, we just have this pattern. And so, and the first order phase transition is just an ideal situation for us, right? Why is that? Because for the first order phase transition to finish, we actually require that uh, the radius of the bubbles uh, at the the radius at, uh, of the bubbles uh, when the phase transition to when the phase when the phase transition to finish to be much much smaller than the than the horizon side, right? And this uh, and because this. Uh, Expansion rate of the bubble is uh, usually the speed of light, right? So the so r much much smaller than the size of the horizon just means that the duration of the source, duration of the bubble, the duration of the phase transition should also be much smaller than the than the horizon. That is just our case, and um, so in the first order phase transition, the 
size of the bubble, uh, the, size, the typical size of the bubble, when this uh, phase transition finished, is actually determined by this beta parameter, which is the derivative of this bounce, um, of the bounce action, divide, uh, bounce action with respect to the, to the time, physical time, right? And uh, so what we actually require is actually this beta value to be much larger than the, than the, than the, uh, than the, than the Hubble expansion rate, right? And then, and then, so basically because the, because the bubble size is much, much smaller as deep inside the horizon, we can just use the result of the flat space time simulation, okay? So now, uh, what I'm, so, so, and there are actually already literatures um, started this uh, first order phase transition during inflation. For, for example, in this model, so what people discuss is called the open inflation. So basically the inflation is actually starts from, uh, starts from a first order phase transition. And uh, in this model, so it is, uh, in this model, the authors started is the gut phase transition at the beginning of the, uh, of inflation. And they, they started this uh, uh, gravitational wave spectrum of this gut phase transition, if it happened right before the inflation period. And in this paper, they actually try to, they actually try to do a generic study of the, uh, the features of the spectrum. And they actually obtained the correct UV behavior of the gravitational wave spectrum uh, during, so from first order phase transition during inflation. However, they missed this oscillatory pattern and they didn't get its correct IR behavior, okay? And so what I want to present it, uh, what I want to present next is the, uh, some simple models, right? For example, uh, we can just uh, write down these simple models and here phi is the infinite field and the sigma is the spectator field, right? And so for all these three models I present, you can see that the first order phase transition can happen. And if we are familiar with the electroweak phase transition, you can just uh, tell that uh, immediately that uh, we just uh, use the electroweak phase transition models by just replacing, uh, replacing the temperature with C phi, right? And the C is a model dependent parameter. Okay. Sorry, can I ask? And, here. Yes. Uh, what's the scale capital lambda there? Uh, it actually model How dependent, big is right? It? Yes. How big is that lambda? How big is lambda? Well, so, actually, can I say it another way? I mean, how big is sigma and how big is lambda? I mean, is your sigma, the value of the field, always much, much smaller than lambda? No, actually, during phase transition, they are they are comparable, right? For this for this model to work, you actually need these two terms to balance with each other. Okay, but then see, but then that, but then then there would be higher order terms, right? There would be sigma to the a over lambda. Yes, or... yes, yes. Then in that case, you can see you can you can work with this model, right? Yes. So so usually in those models, this sigma is comparable to to lambda. You can see this as a toy model, right? If you either like higher correction terms is I don't think it will change the pattern, right? Yeah, that was my question, is whether higher dimension terms here really change the results that much. Yes, so if you want the first order phase transition to happen, you need to require they change this, uh, they can bend this. Uh, uh, so during the phase transition, they will bend the potential, right? So that yeah. these two terms are like, a, uh, so because this term, you can see that the value we chose for lambda is actually negative. And we want this term to, to, to just bend it back, okay? And so if we want to add a more higher dimensional terms, that's it, it's actually okay, right? So all these uh, terms will help, help, it, help this term to bend this uh, potential back, right? Yeah, but yeah. if you have an effective field theory, you, 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 can't, you can't take sigma of order the cutoff. That, that's why, that was why I was worried. No, 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 no that, that is actually depend, right? So the effective theory, it's actually so in that kind of effective theory, you actually compare the momentum with sigma, right? But here, where here this uh, uh, sigma is just like a, a constant field, right? It is not the momentum. So in some sense, this theory is, is also 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 works, right? So yeah, well, yeah. maybe the, the third potential maybe is more generic uh, in and uh, which does not involve higher dimensional terms because your particle. <laughs> Uh, coefficient is positive, right? I, I was curious why why don't you start with the third potential direct? Uh, it's actually I just chose the first one, right? So I think the yeah, three, no, no, the, yeah, all the, the three one, of them is actually 
like equivalent, right? Now there's a, actually there's no much difference for the for, for the for the for the for the next studies. For example, you can see you can you can add higher dimensional terms. You can add as many as you can, and then so uh, I here I don't see any difference. So in the in the qualitative result. Okay. In other words, okay, the one closer to electric phase transition is the third one. Let me say that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, but there's still a lot of people play models with the first. Yeah, one. you can play with the yeah. phase transition, but uh, I, 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 the, I would think the third one is in the, a similar. But even in the third one, again, it depends on on the field value sigma. If sigma depends on what the cutoff is for that theory and whether what the field value sigma is, I would have thought. Uh, yeah, but uh, but still the yeah usually this uh, uh, unitarity argument right is for momentum yeah. for scattering series, mm -hmm. and here the sigma is a constant field right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so I don't I don't know if that uh, argument still apply here. So um, we we have to have this in, in, introduce higher dimensional term and where's the, where the cutoff is right. So for example then the yeah sorry the third one does not involve and. And it's mentioned uh, only what yeah, the third one is okay, yes. But the third, right, one, the third when one when sigma okay. is large. The third one is 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 okay if you can ignore the higher dimension terms, there would be higher dimension terms, right? Uh, um, yes. And, and, and also, I mean still yes. Yeah, I mean there is a characteristic scale, energy scale associated with the phase transition itself, right? So uh, there is an energy scale at game here. Yeah, here the phase transition scale is actually, I think it's comparable to lambda, actually. Yeah, so in the third or third potential, you actually, he actually labeled the, the phase transition scale is, uh, you know, when epsilon approximates the mu effective. Uh, Where is that? Where do you see that? Oh, in the uh, plot, just, I see. Yeah, yeah, in the plot, the third plot, you can see where we, where phase transition takes place. And, mm -hmm. and that's the scale of the excursion you need to do on a sigma director. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Are you are you thinking is is this a, a model the inflationary part is where you're going from small fields to large fields or because otherwise uh, it looks more like the, symmetry restoration from large field to small field yes from large field to small field but then you really have symmetry restoration don't you oh, yes. you have a minus sign out in front of it yeah yeah we have minus sign yes <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but this will have this will get triggered at a particular value of the uh, a particular value of the inflaton. So, and you were talking about Planck scale excursions. So, yes, is mu? You know, we have a C here, right? We have a C here. So basically, the C is a coupling between the so phi square and the sigma square. Right, but if mu is not of order of the Planck scale, then C has to be very small, right? Yeah, C is uh, yes, yes. So C is a tunable like uh, operator here in this uh, toy models. <clears throat> well, but it probably shouldn't be too small because otherwise it gets you know. Then you probably have to worry about loops again, right? Um, huh? No. So C is too small. So usually, if C is very small, then what we need to worry about is signal strength, right? Then the spectator sector will have too small, much, much smaller energy than the total energy, right? And then as you will see, okay. uh, yeah, the total, the energy, the signal strength will be smaller. But just having a, what are you thinking about for mu? Is mu the gut scale or is mu, or is- it actually doesn't matter. doesn't matter. So it depends on, it actually depends on what is the inflation scale, right? So only, so here only the ratio actually matters. Only the, the ratio of... Yeah, the ratio of the total, only the ratio of the energy density in the sigma sector to the, to the energy density in the inflation, in the total energy density matters for the signal strength. Well, what I'm saying is that phi is of order M Planck when this transition happens, right? Phi is order. Well, we, we we don't have to assume that, right? So phi is... Uh, so, so that is only the motivation part. So. So, so what we want to argue is that so the, the excursion of phi is Planck, is, can be as large as Planck scale, right? So then if it couples to any other fields, it will change uh, the, the Lagrangian of the spectator field like 
dramatically, right? And then so we expect something like a first order phase transition to happen. But, but are, yeah. are you doing this during during the period of exponential expansion, or are you doing this after the expan exp exponential expansion? During, during the during the exponential expansion. Well, then phi is of order n Planck. Phi is uh, yes. So in some scenario, yes. Well, it's all around Planck. Small yes. scenarios, I would think, right? Yeah, and the C, but the C can be small, right? So yes. But then you said if C is too small, then you don't, then the signal. Yes. Yeah, so C is. It also depends on the. It also depends on the Hubble during inflation, right? So basically, it also depends on the, on the on the mass of the inflation field. If we are thinking about M square phi square model. Okay. But I mean, <laughs> at some point, if you give us the the various scales that you you want to be looking at, it might help as well. Ah, okay. Oh, let me see. I am not very sure if the next next few slides will help or not. So in the next few slides, we will just uh, calculate this uh, a phase transition and to and to try to try to give an example of gravitational waves. Yeah. Sorry, can, can I ask a different question? Uh, can you say again how you define the time of phase transition? Uh, because mm -hmm. you find yeah, the time. Yeah, I, I think you said it here. Here, yeah, this slide, yeah, that you said the time of phase transition must be much smaller uh, than the yeah than the horizon. Uh, yeah, yes. but what 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 is this time? I mean, the time is uh, just the typical readers of the bubble. If we assume that the bubble expands in speed of light. Oh, okay, so that, that's the time at which uh, the new phase occupies the, the the Hubble patch or something like that. The time. Uh, yeah, because okay, so so there is a bubble. Okay, so it starts expanding, but yes, the bubble is expanding, and the bubble. So, but it so, never ends. I mean, this expansion never ends, right? So, what, what is the? No, the expansion. So, so if the phase transition can complete, right? Then this uh, the, the, it must end, right? So then there will be a typical radius. Then there will be type, typical radius of the bubble. Well, but the universe is also also expanding, right? So yeah, the universe uh, is expanding. Yes. So that, that's, uh, that, that that was the typical problem with the original models, right? That you uh, yeah you have uh, that the bubbles never actually collide because every time you produce a new bubble, it's moving away from the previous bubble faster yeah. than light, and so they even though the bubble is expanding near the speed of light. The bubbles are moving away from each other faster than the speed of light, so they don't collide. Yeah. So that, oh, so that no, is the yeah, just, No, I, yeah. I just yeah, that's why I wanted to understand. So is this yes. really the time at which I mean your your bubble, I mean your new phase it just occupies a single Hubble patch? Okay. Yeah. That, that's so this is uh, yeah. So 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 that, that is why we need that that is why we have this condition, right? So we want this beta to be much much larger than h, right? So this is the condition for the bubble to actually collide with each other before they just are running far away, right? They, they uh, just uh, separate far away, right? This, this is actually also the case for this. Um, so you're so 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 in the for the phase transition in the in the in the in the thermal universe, right? In the radiation dominated area, right? So we also need this condition because the universe is always the universe is always expanding, right? If you want the phase transition to complete, you always want you always need this beta to be much, much larger than H. This is actually the condition I will show, which is which can be satisfied. No, but then I think for production of gravitational waves, you don't you don't have to assume that the new phase, the formation of new phase is complete, right? You, you just have to assume that the bubble yeah, of so, new phase is formed. So, and, and then you don't care if they collide or... Whatever. Yeah, we need to care, yeah. So this, this, this condition is actually for it to complete. And so the, the condition the condition for it to form is actually this one, right? So this one. So this yeah. is the yeah. So this is the bubble nucleation rate, and it's actually simple, right? So it is related to the energy scale to the force in the in the spectator section, and e to the minus s four, and s four is the bounce action. And so for the first, so for so that's why I put here, right? For the phase transition to start, for the so this can be said as for the first time transition to start to finish, we actually require that there is at least one bubble in each Hubble patch, right? And this is only the condition for the first transition to start. And I didn't uh, I didn't say anything about it to complete, right? Yes, so, yes. 
But, but then, yeah. okay, okay. So yeah, as far, as far as understood, so there is this characteristic time scale, and you say it must be much smaller than inverse Hubble in order for you to see this oscillation pattern, right? And this time scale, it's not a time scale of uh, of uh, phase transition to start or to complete, right? It's a phase. It's a time scale of, so to speak, the phase transition itself, right? So that, that's a time scale. That's a characteristic time scale during which this transition happens once it starts happening. Right? No, one star, once it starts to happen, it's actually calculated here, right? So that is the scale that this one. So this one is actually, so this, uh, this beta is actually the scale for ds4 over dt, right? So this is how the bounce changes, right? So if yeah, the bounce yeah. changes, so if the bounce can change very, very fast, right? So th this actually shows that if the bounce can change very fast, then the first, then the first transition just can complete, right? So oh, well. well, so so just like so this is just so, yeah so, sorry okay so maybe we can continue because yeah I mean we can yeah. probably so so th this is a, if you remember how we calculate the first order phase foundation in the radiation dominated area, right? So we also do this right. So we we calculate up we calculate the rate we calc we calculate this condition, we calculate which condition, we calculate we calculate this condition right. And then usually that beta much, much larger than H is automatically satisfied, right? And then beta come, so in that case, we interpret beta as the radius of as the radius of each bubble. Why is that, right? Because beta is the typical time for the phase transition to complete, right? So if that means if beta is much, much smaller than the Hubble size, then the phase transition can just complete. And we can treat the bubble collision uh, as uh, in the case of Minkowski, right? In the flat space time. And also in during the uh, during the phase transition, so when we consider phase transition in the in the in the uh, radiation dominated error, we also consider because the phase transition happened very fast, right? We also consider the Hubble doesn't change, right? It's it's actually the same thing, right? Yeah, okay. okay, yeah. So this is actually different from the the old inflation model, right? So here we are considering what we are considering is a phase transition in the spectator sector, right? It's not in the inflationary sector. Except if you have if S four is very large, right? Then the no, nucleation what, rate is very small, and then it doesn't seem you would complete, right? That's the condition you want to typically from. No, S four should not. S four should be small, right? So the smaller S four is, so the, but you have the S4 much bigger than one. Here. Yeah, S four much bigger. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So we must have this condition, right? So so here from this condition, from this condition. We can calculate S four, right? So the S four must be written like this for the for the for the first transition to start, and we actually require so first for the first of first, for the uh, first order first transition to be strong enough, right? We must uh, we must require S four to be much much larger than one, and then to satisfy this condition, it's actually not very difficult, right? So we actually require that it is m to the fourth. This is the typical. Typical energy scale in the in the in the spectating in the spectator sector, it must be between these two values. You can see that there's actually enough room, right? A lot of room for this to happen. Okay, so and after after this is the more crucial part. We need to calculate the beta, right? And we actually in this case we need to show that this beta over h should be much much larger than one. This is actually very crucial, right? Only when this condition is satisfied, we can see that that the inflation must uh, the 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 phase transition can finish, right? Right. Yeah. Well, let me ask again. Why do you have to assume that phase transition is finished? I mean, if it's not finished, if if there is just bubble, you you already no. If it's not finished, it will be become a second order phase transition. Actually, I'm considering this uh, this scenario, here, right? So because because during the during the evolution of the universe, if we cannot finish uh, here, right? If the if we cannot finish the 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 inflation field, the inflation field will just keep evolving, right? And then it will eventually reach this phase, reach this uh this curve, right? And then it will be second, and uh, and then it will just uh, roll down the potential, right? And then this uh, second order phase transition will happen. No, by finished, I mean that you have bubble which is formed, which is expanding, okay, but there is still an old, the, the old phase, right? So in this sense, uh, it's not finished. 
But since no, you mean you mean outside? So so inside it will be inside the bubble. It will be the new phase. But outside yeah. the bubble, it will be the old phase, right? Yes. However, yes. however, once the once this because the infinite field is still evolving, right? So once it reaches a certain value, then the the old phase will just disappear, and second order phase transition happen. Ah, I see. Right. Yes. So so the, yeah. So that's why we we need to assume, but but even second order phase transition happens. There may always there may also be gravitational wave signals, but that will be more difficult to calculate, right? Because we need to deal with. Yeah, I mean, you can just let it happen, right? If you if you just don't don't, don't care about what happens after that, you just can let it happen. Yeah, we just can let it happen. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, we are here, right? So we must uh, here we must calculate this beta, right? The value of beta, and the value of beta can be written like this, and then we can just uh, reparameterize it with uh, with uh, parameters inside the model, right? And this mu effective is defined in this way as the effective mass square of this uh, spectating spectator field, and uh, and then we can just convert the dependence on t to this. Uh, to the evolution of this uh, uh, infinite field, right? And in this way, so now we are so so we we took this first uh, th this model as an example, right? So so there's no special re reasons, just uh, it, just uh, we 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 it comes to be the first one, right? We consider, okay. So now we just uh, calculate this beta over h, okay? It can be so once we put h here. And we can just uh, translate uh, this uh, find out into a slow row parameter if we assume a slow row inflation models. And then, and then after that, it can be written like this, right? Here is the M Planck, and here is the phi, right? And the phi is here. And now we can just so, and then for the, for the value of the bounds, so how to calculate this one? So we can actually do numerical simulations with this uh, software called uh, Cosmo Transitions. And we can simulate this uh, value of S4 as a function of uh, as function of this ratio, okay, mu a function. Of, so it only depends on this ratio actually. And uh, and after that, we can just uh, calculate the derivative, right? Derivative. And uh, yes, and this is the numerical result. Okay, so now let's try to estimate uh, what is uh, beta over h. So for the value of phi, if we assume if we assume a slow inflation models. Then the value of phi can actually so the the range between phi and the the value of phi at the phase transition and the so the range between them right between between phi phase transition and the phi the end of inflation can be just uh, be related into the into the into the efforts between them okay through this uh, simple formula okay and so 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 now if we assume this is true we assume we always in the in the in the case of slow row inflation, and if we assume, uh, and then if we assume this uh, epsilon is something slow row parameter, it's something like a constant, right? We just want to have something some uh, like order magnitude estimate, and then we can put these things together, and we can get a uh, e forward, right? Uh, the e forward between phase transition and the end of inflation, and for this factor, as we can see from the potential, right? So during when the phase transition happens. There's always some fine tuning between the two terms, right? They must be canceled with each other so that the, the barrier is small enough, right, for the phase transition to happen. And so how to estimate this value? So we want to use uh, the ratio of this uh, mu effective square uh, at, at the position of phase transition to the to the to lambda square, which is the only other parameter, massive parameter in this model, right? So, so we use this value to estimate this value. This ratio, okay, at the at the first, at the time of the first transition, and then so putting everything together, we can have beta over h in this form, okay, and then it's very interesting that the ds4 over the s4 as a function of a mu effective can be fit, can be fit very well by a by a by a, by a, by, a, by, a, by by like a mu effective square, right? This is a second order. Uh, polynomial, not polynomial. So yes, and uh, so and so for different choices of lambda, the 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 quality coupling, we have different curves, and then we put these values in, and we, what we can get is that the value of beta over h 
is something like a 4,000 divided by NE, the, the number of e fours, And so if lambda is uh, like a minus uh, one half, and uh, it can be about 500 divided by NE if lambda equals minus one, just in this model, right? So other models we haven't, we haven't done the numerical uh, numerical simulation yet. And uh, so this is roughly the result. And so from the experience of this uh, of this numerical calculation, what we can we can get a feeling of, of how large beta over h is, right? So beta the number of beta over h is something like uh, between ten and uh, hundred, right? I think it is uh, something like a, the, the 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 natural value for the beta for the for this ratio, and this ratio is actually very crucial to us because uh, once we have done this calculation, right? So this uh, this is the the spectrum the um, Radic abundance of the gravitational waves today, right? And it is actually related. To, it is related to the uh, energy density of the radiation, right? And times all these factors, okay? And so, so that starts from this factor first. So this factor is actually the gravitational wave spectrum uh, in flat space, right? Because this the bubble collision is deep inside the horizon, so we can just calculate. We can just use the uh, flat uh, flat space result. And then there is a, so, so this is a delta rho vacuum is actually the latent energy in the spectating sector. And of course, the, in the end, all the, so here we assume that all the energy of the, uh, of the inflation potential, inflaton potential uh, are converted into the radiation energy, right? So then there will be, so then if we calculate this radical right energy of this uh, gravitational wave, there's always this ratio, okay? This is third hydro vacuum latent energy divided by the total energy density of the inflaton field. So this is a suppression factor. And there's also a dilution factor here, right? This is the H inflation to the force divided by Kp to the force. And then remember Kp is the physical momentum of this gravitational wave when it is produced during the phase transition, right? And uh, so if it is within the horizon, it will evolve outside her during its during its evolution, right? It is a, so it is a, so because the universe is expanding, right? So it is a redshift, and so the energy density redshift as a to the minus four, right? So that's why there is such a ratio here, okay? And once it is outside the horizon, uh, it will stop. Uh, it will so its amplitude will not change, right? And so in the end, so we can we can we can in the end we can show that there's only this dilution factor. Uh, and there's also oscillation part, which is here. And uh, this oscillation part is actually smeared, right? It, there's a smearing factor by the finite size. And the smearing fact, we know that the typical size is actually beta inverse, right? So then this is the typical smearing factor. Uh, and we also can calculate the redshift, right? So because we want to calculate today's spectrum. So the so the today's uh, frequency divided by the frequency f star. So f star is the frequency once this mode is produced, right? So it is uh, actually depends on the depends on the uh, depends on this ratio. This eight tau star is the is the 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 scale factor once the phase transition happen, and the a one is the scale factor when inflation uh, at the end of inflation, right? And so this number just give is proportional to e to the minus NE and NE is number of E4, right? So you can see that the position of this gravitational wave is actually strongly depends on when it happened during inflation, okay? And also it also depends on, it also depends on here, the Hubble at during inflation because this gives us the reheating temperature, right? And so, and so because today, Today's temperature is, is this, the CMB temperature. So this is a, actually give additional red shifts. Okay, and so putting everything together, we can get our numerical results. And uh, yeah, so this is, a, this is a numerical result. And you can see that for, uh, for, for, for phase transition happen at different time, at different time during inflation, it's actually the, the position, the position of the gravitational wave, like in this, uh, in this picture, can be very different, right? For example, for example, if NE is roughly at a thirty-eight, right? If it is around, if it is around thirty-eight or around forty, it is the, the today's spectrum is actually here, right? And it can be, if we are lucky enough, it can be tested by the uh, pulsar timing array observations, right? And so, 
And if it is, uh, NE is roughly around 25, then it is here, right? It can be tested by this uh, satellites, okay? And uh, if, it is, uh, if it is here, right? If it is only about uh, 15, right? If it is here, then it might be able to test it by future, uh, future terrestrial gravitational wave detectors, okay? And so, and so, so, yeah, so we can see that the, so the beta here is the typical, beta is the typical physical momentum, right? And so basically, so, so the beta over H is actually determines the dilution factor, okay? So there's a dilution factor here. So basically the beta over H is larger than the signal becomes smaller, right? But we can also see that the smaller the size, the smaller the size, the smaller the size of the source, right? Then the more wiggles we can have, right? The more oscillations we can have, right? So now you can see that if the beta over H is around 10, for example, for these figures, right? Beta over H is around 10. You can see that there are a very small number of wiggles. There are about three, three wiggles we can actually see, right? And if it is about five, then we can only see like one wiggle, right? Two peaks. But uh, for larger beta over H, we can have a lot of oscillation wiggles we can, we can see, but the, the signal is also become smaller, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, actually, and also for beta over H is very, it's, uh, as small as two, right? Actually, we, cannot, we can no longer trust the flat space simulation of, uh, of uh, the bubble collisions. So we need to do, if we want to really want to understand that, we need to do simulations ourselves. And if the uh, and if the uh, the if NE so NE is the the, the E forwards when this uh, E forwards before the end of inflation. So if it is around sixty, right? And so here we it also depend on the on the on the value of the Hubble, right? So if we choose Hubble as ten to the twelve, and if NE is around sixty, then this spectrum can be shown can can be shown like in the in the in the in the CMB B mode, right? We can see that. So these blue curves are the simulation, uh, the, are the are the are the simulations, and you can see that. Uh, uh, oh, and this black one, this black one is the traditional, not the, not traditional. It's black one is actually the the gravitational wave produced by quantum fluctuations uh, during inflation, right? And you can you can compare these uh, these curves, but you can see that there are additional wiggles. Okay, there are additional wiggles. Due to this, uh, uh, due to this nature of instantaneous, instantane, inst instantaneous of the phase, first order phase transition, right? And uh, you can see that here we assume beta over h is about thirty, and you can see that it can be actually larger than this is the value for this is the gravitational, uh, the B mode produced by the, uh, produced by the by the by the quantum fluctuation with the r equal to uh, three times ten to the minus three, right? Uh, and you can see that we can actually produce detectable like signatures even by the future uh, CMB observers. And here the fluctuation is actually very small, right? You can see that is because in the CMB we actually decompose the the we decompose the spectrum into spherical harmonics, right? And we know that the spherical harmonics are not completely orthogonal with the Fourier modes. So then the wiggles gets, uh, the size of the wiggles gets further surprised. Okay, so here's a summary. And uh, so we started the features of classical gravitational waves from instantaneous source during inflation. We show that there's an oscillatory feature in the spectrum, which can help us to identify the the, the, the source, right? And the slopes of the spectrum can tell us uh, information about uh, inflation models and the evolution of the, uh, the universe after inflation. And uh, also the first order phase transition during inflation can be realized uh, with simple models. That's what we show at last. And so if we are lucky enough, we also show that such a signal can be detected by future uh, gravitational wave detectors. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Let's give some virtual applause or let's unmute ourselves and applause as, as well. Thanks a lot for the nice talk. Uh, there were a lot of interesting questions during the talk. Is there any more question from the audience? Uh, I have a question myself. So uh, in the upper right, 
plot on this slide. Uh, is this just the analytic uh, calculation or is this actually the uh, result of a simulation? This one. Mm -hmm. uh, so the for the model for the for the for the IR part, right? It is uh, for the IR part and the oscillatory part. Mm -hmm. It is actually analytical, mm -hmm. and for the UV part, it's actually depend on the detailed models. And so we used so so this a uh, T tilde, right? So we we use this actually from this uh, flat space simulation because uh -huh. it's already deep UV. So what did you assume in the smearing factor? Uh, uh, smearing factor, right? Yeah. Smearing factor, we just, uh, uh, we just, yeah, we, we smear it by, by, we assume there's something like a window function. And we smear, yeah, so you understand, uh -huh. right? Yes. So I mean, and for this one, we didn't use a Gaussian. So what we use is, uh, we just use a square window function to smear it. Uh -huh. Yeah, this part is also model dependent. Yes, and for detailed models, we need to do, we need to simulate it. I see. So I guess that depends on the size of the window that you spare it with, right? Because I, yeah, I was just surprised that when I look at the uh, plot where you sh you show the gravitational wave. Uh, yes, we use it, this. Uh, we use beta as the window. Yes. Uh huh. So in in uh in theory, it's possible that in some realistic model, it's so smeared that we actually don't see the oscillatory feature. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh -huh. uh, well, well, yeah, so the size, so it is smeared by the size of the smearing effect is the size of the source, right? So, mm -hmm. so, yes, so, yeah, so, so, so if the, if the source is like a, a much smaller than the, smaller than the horizon, we don't expect it is smear all this, uh, you, you, all this, all the pattern, right? Mm -hmm. And it actually sm only smear this, uh, this, this uh, UV part. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Thanks. So, so I just I just had a follow up question. So, so you analyze it for these toy models and the parameters you just chose in order to get a signal. What would happen if you actually chose something like a gut phase transition? I mean, how would the signal change? Uh, it, would it still uh, be detectable by some of these experiments or not? Ah, uh, so here you can see that uh, no, we actually so so this spectrum is actually doesn't depend much on this uh, detailed phase transition model. So we can see the only, spec so this one is actually, uh, so this is the flat space result, right? It is actually universal. So if it is, if the, so, so basically during inflation, there's a, the plasma is actually surprised, right? So because the Hawking temperature is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, at a scale of the Hubble, which is a much, which is actually small, right? And so the, so most of the energy is actually in the, most of the energy is actually in the in the bubble wall, right? So then, so then, if this uh, if it is in the, generated in the bubble wall, then it actually only depends on the spec the flat space spectrum is actually only depend on this uh, this latent this latent energy, right? So then this part is actually fixed, okay? This part is fixed, and then the only part which is not fixed is uh, actually this one. No, there are two parameters. So this parameter is not fixed. And this parameter is not fixed, right? So, yeah, and this parameter, so, uh, yeah, so in these plots, what we assume is that this parameter is 0.1, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, actually depends on, so you'll see it's gut model, but uh, even for gut model, this is still a kind of a free parameter, right? So unless you tell me what is the gut model related, uh, what is the relation between the gut model and the inflation sector? Yeah, so you're saying then that for these parameters, you actually could, Construct a yes. model. Uh, no, no, no. I didn't say that. So what did you yeah, say? So oh, this yeah. is a, just if you have this is a general study. So basically, if you have a model which can give you this uh, study, but this parameter is actually not very important, right? So you can see it is uh, the result is a linear dependence with this one, right? With this number. So if yeah. it's point one, it's like this, and then if it's point oh one, it's just uh, get down by one order magnitude. You can see that one order magnitude in this plot is uh, actually not very large, right? Yeah, so no, the most I understand. I understand. I just had a simple question. I mean, look, I, I understand that you can change the premise. I'm, I'm just, I was just asking that if you had a gut model, yes. which one of these curves would would cover that parameter space of the gut model? But uh, how is? But yeah, first we need to know how is this gut model related to the to the inflation sector, right? 
Uh, yeah, I, I'm asking you, have people constructed gut models and related to the inflation sector that overlaps uh, so, the curves? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we didn't, so actually there's a work by, by these guys. Right? Yeah, I mean, I'm basically so they, asking a question about that paper. I mean, yeah, yeah. do the curves so, in that paper overlap with some of your curves or or, or you or your curve or your signals much stronger? Yeah, so actually they, they can, so... Yeah, we examined their papers. Actually, oh, wow. their their curve they also they also calculate this curve, right? Although they missed this oscillatory pattern, right? Oh, I see. And I so see. so basically, they can they, they claim they can get observable like signals from mm -hmm. yes in the in the CMBB mode. I see. Oh so, yeah, but not in the but not in the but not in the gravity wave then. No, because it is because they consider this uh their gut phase transition is actually right at the beginning of the phase transition. So I what see. they are considering is that the, if there there was a thermal bath and which is cooling down, and once once this thermal bath is cooling down, the inflation happens. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the, the gas theory is actually in the thermal bath. And during the cooling, there's a phase transition happen. And during the phase transition, it's actually like a, a transition between uh between radiation dominance and the inflation. So they had to make some special assumptions is what you're saying then. Yes, that is uh, what they started, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, yeah. because I was just wondering if you could actually eventually distinguish between different gut phase transitions. That's what I was wondering. Uh, but you're saying not not with the gravity waves, that, that that's unlikely to distinguish between different gut phase transitions. Uh, what do you mean by different gut phase transition? Or oh, different groups, different uh, matter content. Groups. Uh, Group. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that might not be. I'm not sure think, yet. But... Yeah, and I think different different group, uh, different patterns will give you different delta rho vacuum, which is the energy difference between the broken and unbroken phase. Uh -huh. However, yeah, the degeneracy. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. However, the observable is uh, surprised uh, in addition by how how you know inflationary energy enters in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then I think I'll go to the next uh, slide. Yes. There, there's a big dilution factor from inflation for, for your gravity wave signal. Big dilution factor. Oh, there, there, there's another equation you were showing us um, just a moment ago. This one? Uh, yeah, here. Yes. Yeah, the first factor. The, 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 it, it, isn't this a big dilution factor or, or small? Yeah, so the yeah, so 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 yes, so sometimes it can be bigger, it's also can be small, right? So the typical value of KP is actually beta, right? Uh -huh. So then that's why that's why here I, I said that this this number is actually very crucial. So what do we, yeah. we we want to calculate this, this number and we claim that uh, from the experience of this simple example, which we ca can get a feeling that uh, generically, right, this beta over H should be around uh, out of 10 to 100. So that is this uh, like a dilution factor. So dilution factor is 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus eight, something like that. And so so here we assume, so here you can see that if it is a uh, 10, right? Then it's uh, the typical signals, the typical size is like this. It's 10 to the minus 12 for omega GW. Uh, we also assume that this number, right? Yeah, this, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this number should there's a, some degeneracy here, right? So yes, and if it is fifty, then like we are doomed, right? So there's a uh, almost no way. Uh, yeah, but still, if there's a uh, something called the BBO phase two, right? If it can be built, like maybe in a hundred years, right? And then maybe you can still observe some signal in the future. So the nanograph uh, result fits uh, this plot, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, can you comment on what nanograph uh, reported? I mean, they found... Sorry, comment on... You know, um, the Takati gravitational wave background, right, with frequency, like, in inverse huh? year. For nanograph, it is at around uh, nanohertz. Nanohertz, right? Nanohertz. And uh, nanohertz. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, nanohertz is something like here, right? Yeah. So basically, you can see that if we remove, if we move this curve to here, right? 
do do you mean the nanograph, the the, the uh, nanograph anomaly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the nanograph. Yeah. yeah, we can. I think probably we can feel that, but we didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, read the paper. <laughs> so so basically, if we tune the red the NE to be to be about uh, 30, 38. And then if we tune this uh, beta over H to be two, right? Although we, we don't want, we cannot trust that, that result, but uh, for the outer magnitude, it should be, it should be okay, right? For the outer, because it's already close to, close to one. So we can, we do not trust the flat space simulation of this, uh, of the, uh, of the gravitational waves what we used for bubble collisions, right? But, uh, I think for order magnitude, it should be okay. So, so then if we if we do this, then we can have a curve here, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, can reach this ten to the minus nine value, which is a uh, nanograph observed, right? claim to observe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, any more questions? If not, then let's thank Haipong again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us so late there. Appreciate it.